If you want to mitigate national insurance contributions, <coughs> dividends out of a family company is as easy as it gets. And with reducing rates of corporation tax, with increasing rates of national insurance contributions, in any situation, any situation you take, you will always be better off by drawing money out of a company by way of dividend compared to salary bonuses. Just, it is just a fact. It is just absolutely a fact. That, of course, gives rise to all sorts of interesting planning points, like can you get shares to employees to get dividends to them? Well, yes, you can. You can generally do that. You can create funny classes of shares which should have no intrinsic capital value, might be subject to forfeiture restrictions and such like. Um, but as a dividend conduit, that is still perfectly permissible planning. Um, bullet point two there. It's stating the obvious, isn't it? If you've got, I mean, we've been doing it for donkey's years. This is exactly what we've been doing for donkey's years. You spread income around. What we've done hitherto is thought, well, we'll use up, try and make sure everybody covers their personal allowance, try and make sure everybody covers their basic rate tax bands. But now we've got a 50% band at £150,000. It clearly makes sense to sort of drag as many people out of that as you can and spread it as wide as you can, even if it means triggering tax at basic rate or the 40% high rate. Clearly makes sense to do that. And you can do that by having suitable share structures, suitable trust structures. Um, it's, it is not hard to get income around a family. It is not hard. The penultimate point there is um, the concept of using something called an, an EBT, a remuneration trust. The, the revenue hate it. The revenue have said they're going to legislate against it. But the revenue have lost cases on it. The law is not how the revenue would like it to be. It's not for the uninitiated, it's not for widows and orphans, but if people thought, well, yes, I mean, I think there's a punt there and I'll do it before, the, before April 2011 when the law is going to change, let, let's do it. So there are opportunities there. You get profits in a company and you extract without triggering any further personal taxes. Final point, very easy one, although there's an interesting sort of issue here. If you were coming up to retirement and you habitually take income out of a company of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of pounds a year, you may think, well, rather than do that, I won't do it. I won't take the income. I don't need the income. I'm quite rich anyway. What I will do is, when I retire, I will induce the company to buy in my shares, which will be a, a transaction for capital gains tax purposes. And because I get entrepreneur relief, I'll only pay tax at 10% on that. Whereas if I was stripping dividends out as I go along, my effective rate of tax might be 25%, might be 36.11%. Those percentages I banded around earlier it might be that. Clear saving, isn't there? It is not exactly rocket science. That is pretty basic stuff. You can't do it if you're going to continue with the company. You can't sort of sell in shares, dribs and drabs and say, well, that's capital. This is fantastic. It's not income. There's all sorts of anti-avoidance provisions that won't allow you to do that. But if you are going to retire, rolling up your last few years income and taking it out in capital form is good. So for final, understand and exploit the rules with business assets for CGT purposes. I've told you about that. That's entrepreneur relief. I've, I've covered that. Um, the final two points there are aimed at inheritance tax and the point here is simple because the Tories did not deliver on their inheritance tax promise you need to look for other solutions and the easy solutions are to put in place structures so that you qualify for business property relief or agricultural property relief put it bluntly if you went out and bought a farm if you've got a load of cash and you buy a farm you haven't got the cash liable to inheritance tax, you've got the farm not liable to inheritance tax. That's a very simple way of looking at it, but it just illustrates the point. But you can do similar things with businesses. You can construct businesses that will qualify. BPR is a, is a, is a happy hunting ground. The final point there is sort of the nuclear point, which is that there is a most peculiar exemption from inheritance tax if you give shares to an employee trust. What's unusual about it is you don't need a trading company. If you have an investment company, 
that won't qualify for business property relief and you bequeath the shares to an employee trust, it's exempt inheritance tax. It's slightly unbelievable. Who will the employees be? Uh, they'll be your children. You'll make them directors. How does that work? Well, it works because there's a specific exemption, but fundamentally, the exemption doesn't apply if beneficiaries are connected, are already shareholders or are all connected with shareholders. Now, you will say, well, that's no good, Wood. If you've got shares and the beneficiaries of your sons, they will be connected with you, won't they? And you're, you'll be right to think that. You would be absolutely right to think that. Except you can't be connected with a dead person. Or to put it another way, when you're dead, you can't be connected with a live person, perhaps. But dead people and live people can't be connected with each other. So if you do it on death, your children no longer are connected with you. And the blocking legislation that the revenue probably think negates this just doesn't work. just doesn't work. So look, that's, that's a real gallop through some planning points. I'll, I can talk to you at the end. I've slightly overrun the tea, but we can catch up after, afterwards. I've been, before I start the capital gains tax um, topic, I've been asked just to comment briefly on a national insurance contributions topic that I touched on and sort of whizzed over, which is simply what is my view on dividends continuing to be outside the scope of national insurance contributions, um, which is a big, big topic. Uh, my view is obviously worthless, but um, I'll tell you what I think. There was a case recently called PA Holdings. Now, this is a case that is not in the real world. What did PA Holdings do? Um, and I was talking to my friend in the middle there who had some experience of this. They wanted to pay their workers in a tax efficient way. Let's put it no more grandly than that. So what did they do? They created a special purpose company which in those days would have been an unlimited company. It's very esoteric. And they would have subscribed for a load of shares in this unlimited company at a premium. A big share premium account would have been on these shares. Why did they do that? They did that because with an unlimited company, under the law as it was, i.e. the 1985 Companies Act, so you don't actually need to use an unlimited company now because the 2006 Companies Act has changed the, changed the law in this regard. But as it was then, under the 85 Companies Act, with an unlimited company, you could effect a capital reduction scheme without applying to the court. And if you effect a capital reduction scheme in a company with a big share premium account, the effect is that the share premium account becomes a distributable reserve. So you now have a company with a distributable profit in it, owned by the employees who have been given the shares in this thing. Uh, and what happens next? The company pays a dividend, basically. And as we highlighted earlier, what's the rate of tax on a dividend? If you're a 40% income tax payer, you only pay 25% on a dividend because of the tax credit. So lo and behold, income tax lower than would otherwise be the case because it's a dividend and even though it's exposed to higher rate income tax it's at the dividend rate which is an effective rate of 25 percent but no national insurance contributions because it's a dividend perfect hey eh? dream bloody brilliant um what happened next the revenue have a right i'll go and off to the courts they go and the conclusion is this that for income tax purposes it works because in the income tax legislation, there is a distinct prescribed pecking order. If you have a dividend, which is a dividend, it's taxed as a dividend. In old, in old money, it's taxed under Schedule F, not under Schedule E. In current money, it's the, the dividend tax charge takes precedence over the employment income tax charge. So great, dividends, it works. But for national insurance contributions, there is no corresponding concept. There is no pecking order. For national insurance contributions, the question was, is it, does it is it, is it, is it earnings that arises from the employment? 
and the courts held it was. So in PA Holdings, whilst they won on the income tax, they lost on the national insurance contributions. 